It's good. Awesome. Cool. So, Dr. Cibrian Jamorio, um, do, do you want to talk about where you're where you're at right now? Sure. I am a scientist in uh, Langebio, which is the national lab for uh, of genomics for biodiversity in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And our mission is to study mostly Mexican biodiversity because we're a, a very uh, biodiverse rich country, but also other other plants and animals from around the world using mostly using genomic tools, but also mm -hmm. a little bit of um, other disciplines that have to do with what we understand general generically as molecular biology. Yeah. And so I, I think of you as a psychiatrist person, right? Because is, is that yeah. what you were doing your PhD on more or? Not really. I actually did my PhD uh, with palms, but I, I would describe myself as an evolutionary biologist. Okay. And, and that also in a way allows me to work in very different systems. But the questions are always trying to understand or focused on trying to understand the evolutionary history of plants for the most part. Most mm -hmm. recently I've started uh, working with bacteria but it's always within their plant associations. So, yeah. um, so for my PhD at Columbia University, I worked on population genetics of palms. Right. Um, okay. And then I worked very briefly with Arabidopsis during my postdocs. I had three different postdocs in different oh institutions yeah, from the New York Botanical insane. Garden to um, Harvard and NYU. Mm -hmm. um, and then I returned, or I began uh, studying psychids when I was at the New York Botanical Garden. And then from okay. then on, I've been working with, with psychids. So it's been gotcha. like 10 years now or more. Yeah, I guess that I, I guess that's, I, I met you very briefly and you were a psychic yeah. person then, but yeah, I, I forgot about the palms. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. They look, <laughs> they, they look very similar. So I know, but I shouldn't make that mistake. That's a bad, no, I that's know, a I bad know. mistake for me to make. No, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't tell the, don't tell the psychids I said that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so what, what kind of things have you been up to now since you've started your faculty position? Yeah, um, well, on one hand, my lab is working on domestication, questions related to domestication and mm. the genomic basis of, of how wild relatives become domesticated forms, basically, and all the um, genomic changes that take place for such a rapid morphological, mostly morphological change in uh, plants. Yeah. So we focus on Mesoamerican crops. We work with capsicum, with chili pepper. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with chia as well, but capsicum is our main, our main uh, crop. Mm -hmm. And what we've done there is we've just, we recently published a paper on MB um, that talked about how changes in gene expression regulated either by cis or trans acting elements in the genome are, mm -hmm. are Essentially, that's the main mechanism for chili pepper domestication. Basically, the fruit becoming a lot bigger and having all sorts of shapes, um, yeah, and so all sorts of varieties. And and that's that's kind of a good generalizable lesson about the way morphological evolution works in all kinds of multicellular organisms, right? Is that it's often the, the changes in regulatory mechanisms and not so much the um, you know necessarily the protein coding genes, you know, that we yeah. Have. Yeah. Well, especially things that happen very fast in evolution, right. like right. like domestication happened in thousands of years. Like the, mm -hmm. the phenotype changes happen very, very quickly because we artificially select. So, yeah. so genome changes have to happen fast as well. And gene expression is a, a good mechanism for that because you don't have to change the coding region essentially, right? right? right. So that's yeah. the domestication line of the lab, but there's yeah. a huge component of my lab that works on psychids. So I cool. haven't left psychics alone um, or behind. Or, um, so mm -hmm. what we're doing there, there's a small component of the lab working on the population genetics of psychics, just basically how individuals are connected in the landscape. And that has a more conservation approach to it. Mm -hmm. um, but the really exciting novel work that we've been doing, and we have a lot of things that are going to come up, hopefully, soonish <laughs> in the next couple of years or so, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, from, from here on, is... Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to understand why psychics have not changed on the outside physically from, yeah. you know, similar to their, or they're very similar to their fossils, mm -hmm. to the fossils that we've, we have found that are like 400 million years old. Um, yeah. So that's like before, that's like Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic. Permian, like yeah. they were, yeah. yeah End of the were, Permian. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically they have, they have um, not changed externally. So these are one of the, Fo living fossil lineages that I don't really like that word because they change a lot, but they, they just Good. morphologically on the outside, they look the same as their ancestors. Um, so 
So what we've hypothesized is that their survival has, depend, has been dependent on um, bacteria that are in their roots, which are, are highly specialized roots that they have, which other gymnosperms don't have, and that these bacteria allow them to change very quickly underneath, basically, you know, inside. Um, oh. And also, oops, sorry. There was a there was a <laughs> strange call coming in my in my um, computer. Sorry about oh, that's that. Okay. Um, yeah. But that and that the way that the back, that this happens is that bacteria transfer metabolites that cycads use to essentially adapt to the landscape. Huh. Um, so cycads survive in places where other plants cannot because they're very. Um, they they live in soils that have very poor nutrients that require very efficient transfer of. of of um, basic elements to the plant, mm -hmm. and so we we think that this is done in great to a great deal through the bacteria that live in their roots. So we're looking into that. So is there is there like nitrogen fixation happening? Is it is it yeah. that kind of thing? Yeah, cycads are one of the actually the only gymnosperm that we know of that has specialized not like nodules that are called coralloid oh. roots, which are these roots that look like coralloids corals that look like corals like little cool. fingers. Um, yeah. and, and there's uh, cyanobacteria that fix nitrogen in there. But huh. although this organ has been studied for more than 100 years, no one had deeply described anything else other than cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. And so what we did for the first time along with the Chinese group, we were the two first groups in the world to discover that there's like 300 genera of all sorts of bacterial groups in there. And they're not oh, just fixing so cool. nitrogen, they're doing many other things. So that's what we're, huh. we're studying. That's really cool. So even though there's there's been sort of morphological stasis or you know just minimal morphological evolution in cycads, there's probably been a lot of molecular evolution and um, exactly. metabolic evolution that you know exactly. partially in the cycads, partially in the microbiome, the kind of exactly. rhizosphere kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh, cycads so cool. also have a lot of um, highly specialized interactions with insects that are their strict pollinators. That means mm. they cannot survive without the cycad. Um, and the cycad cannot survive without them, which are beetles. And they also have very, very few herbivores, um, insect yeah. herbivores. Basically, everyone gets intoxicated because they're highly, highly toxic plants because right. of these metabolites that we huh. think the bacteria produces for them. Oh, so the so bacteria now, are probably making the, the protective secondary metabolites too, huh? Or well, that's our hypothesis. The defensive, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, so we're now looking into the insects as well to see if we have a convergence, convergent evolution of the microbiome of the insects that are inside the cycads toward the same, either the same metabolites or, or ways of processing these metabolites so that themselves don't get intoxicated by the cycad, the cycad um, chemical like repertoire, basically. Yeah, that, that's for the pollinators or for the... Both, uh, pollinators and herbivores. Predators. Yeah, herbivores, yeah. Both. Well, cool. both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is the pollinators are are they pollen are they eating the pollen too or what's what's their No, it, they're butterflies. They're lysinid oh, butterflies okay. and they eat the leaves when they're larvae. And when they're adult they don't eat anything. They're just flying around. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So so how does I I guess I don't I have no idea how pollination works. Is is it a uh, it, the, the butterflies just just travel back and forth between the cycads because that's where they want to oviposit. Or the, the butterflies are not the pollinators; they're the predators. They eat the the, oh, 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 the, the larvae eat the the leaves. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So the, gotcha. the the butterflies, the larvae eat the leaves. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the the beetles, beetles. they oh. pollinate the plant because they they take they part of their life cycle actually takes place inside the um, the megastrobilus. That's that's how it's called. It's like a cone. Um, yeah. And so what they do is at some point the adults emerge and from one plant and go to the other plant. They fly, they get attracted by, we think, um, plant, plant pheromones, mm -hmm. phyto, phytohormones um, yeah. and, that are produced on the other uh, cone. Well, cone is a strange word, but it's strobilus basically. Strobilus, but the, on, yeah. the other, on the other cone, uh, mm -hmm. which actually heats up and liberates like all these chemicals that attract these the insects. Yeah. Huh. Volatiles, exactly. Yeah. Um, the insects go there and then they come back. So that's how the, the plant gets pollinated. But those that's, are the beetles. Yeah. So are are they dioecious? Are they they're yeah. they're two they're separate, separate sexes? Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so from a 
from like the perspective of like the conservation pop gen stuff is is there a lot of issues with like forest fragmentation and, and things like that is that kind of what people are worried about with, with that yeah i mean psychics are known for their low genetic variability for some mm -hmm. groups not all because we've seen that in uh, oceanic islands that's not the case and also some genera here in mexico mm -hmm. <laughs> there is a lot of variation still there mm -hmm. but because they're dioecious um and there's a lot of population fragmentation because of habitat loss sometimes there are very few um, pollen donors in the population and they're also very slow you know these are like yeah. very large slow plants right. so they reproduce very slowly I mean not slowly but very late some mm -hmm. like when they're we what people have estimated like 50 years of age yeah um, it's crazy they're very yeah, and so and not every, not all the not every year they they don't do it every year and not mm -hmm. all the cones are not there every year both females and males. Anyway, so they have strategies that are not very convenient when there's yeah. huge habitat loss, right, and yeah, degradation. Sure. So I, maybe I should mention that there's we have we have a bunch of questions with this corollary group. So we're yeah, also sure. looking at the fungus that is inside. So people have reported fungus as mycorrhizae in the primary root, but not, sorry, and not, not the specialized little corolloid root that I mentioned before. Oh, cool. And we discovered that there are fungi. Um, hmm. And so we think that these fungi might actually be moving metabolites within the plant and maybe even bacteria. So that's something that we're, they're like highways between, uh, within the plant. So that's something wow. we're looking into now. That's and we found viruses too, that we don't know what they're doing there, probably controlling, controlling the cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. that, that we're still looking into. So that's kind of, the, those are the really cool things that we're doing. Um, we're also using other types of techniques like mass spectrometry and microscopy to actually look at these things because up to now it was all metagenomics and genomics, mm -hmm. but now we actually want to visualize things. And we do that in collaboration with other groups that are specialists in these kinds of things. Cool. So you're doing like the whole metabolome and the like, yeah, just, wow, that's really cool. Um, yeah. Do you, do you want to talk about pepper or vanilla or, or some of the domesticated crops too? Because those are... Oh, well, vanilla, actually, yeah, we, I, forgot to, I forgot about vanilla. <laughs> it's not, not a good idea, huh? So vanilla... vanilla oh, you don't have was, to. Yeah, we can no, talk about no. whatever you want, yeah. I can talk about vanilla. I mean, it's okay. just, it's, there's just so much in psychics that we're discovering, and, oh, and it's yeah, just yeah, so yeah. exciting that I want to talk about that. But actually, vanilla is actually a very nice system as well. So hmm. vanilla was my first love, really. So I, oh. when I, when, when I um, started my undergrad at UNAM, that's the National University here in Mexico, I wanted to study orchids because I thought it was fascinating how they like basically became insects, you know, in their flower shapes yeah. to attract other, to, to ensure pollination and so on. Absolutely. And so I ended up working with vanilla as an undergrad, which oh, is an cool. orchid. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to see, it was population genetics, and we wanted to see how many populations were left of the wild vanilla in Mexico, because the cultivated vanilla, at that time already, everyone knew it's a clonal, basically clonal clones of each other in, in most of the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's, an, it's native to Mexico, as, as with capsicum. Actually, yeah. the genus is domestic, the species was domesticated here, but the genus is South American for, for chili pepper. Oh, okay. Oh, for, for yeah. chili pepper, but for, for vanilla, pepper, it's sorry. Yeah. For okay. vanilla, it's Mexican. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Don't no, okay. <laughs> I don't mean to confuse fine. you. Um, I, I, I always remember, like chili pepper, I think is more obvious. I think a lot of more people know that, but I always, I forget about vanilla because it's, it's produced so much in like Madagascar. Other and, places, and other right? Places yeah. That, um, well, those plants yeah. were taken from here, most likely right. from Veracruz. Um, so I, I did population genetics on that. And essentially we looked for vanilla for like a year in the field. It was terrible because at that time I had had an, a car accident, not oh, very no. bad, but I was wearing those horrible collars oh, and, we were, no. <laughs> and we were looking for vanilla in really, um, you know, essentially um, wet forests, you know, like at oh. 35 Celsius degrees, which is a lot. Uh, it's like a hundred, I don't know how much it is in, in Fahrenheit, it's, but it's a lot. It's, it's 95. It's yeah, 95 it's, or so. It's, it's, it's like, like 93, 95. Yeah. But if it's very, humid, if, if you're in a forest, that's impossible. Very you can't, humid forest. Yeah. And we were looking for vanilla there. I was dying. Anyway, yeah. we didn't find very many. <laughs> <laughs> and I was allergic to vanilla on top of it, but anyway. Oh, so yeah, I, yeah. It's good. So, like, if you touch it, it, you get, like, a rash or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, oh, no. So, anyway, so, so we didn't find very many. And the ones that we found were all clonal to each other except in one small region in Mexico. So we concluded oh. that they're almost gone in the wild, which is very sad. Huh. Um, not all of the species, there are several species here in Mexico, but the 
commercial one, which is vanilla planifolia, that are, there are very few wild populations left in Mexico. Hmm. Anyway, that was as an undergrad. So I didn't go back to vanilla for a long, long time until about two years ago. So that was a very long time. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. And what I decided to revisit it because I, well, I just, I wanted to go back to vanilla and, and uh, what we did it, we went to the plantations again, where I went like when I was an undergrad in 2000. <laughs> wow, and yeah. and um, the main problem that people want to f- solve is the infection by a fungus that's, that it's actually, yeah, by a fungus that's called Fusarium, which is very common in a lot, in a lot of crops. Hmm. So basically that's the number one problem worldwide in vanilla plantations. So we decided to take a look at that. Um, and what we did was microbiomes of sick and healthy plants of both the roots and the stems, like all sorts of parts of the plant, um, mm. to see if we could find something in the in the microbiome that would tell us why some plants were surviving and why others were not. Because some plants do survive, and others get like really bad during the the fusarium infection. Yeah. Um, and so what we did is we sequenced fusarium from both healthy and and sick, and we also did all the bacterial microbiome that that's associated to it. That was with 16S and ITS. Right. And what we found is that the, bac- the fungi is actually more or less the same, but the bacteria is more diverse in the sick plant and in the healthy plant is less diverse. So we're still mm. trying to make sense of that. Um, oh. But what was very interesting, and that's something we're writing up right now to publish, is that the fusarium genomes of the sick plant contained uh, regions of the genome that are very well known to have protein effectors that essentially kill the plant. Whereas the plants that weren't dying, especially the wild ones, um, oh, not the, well, I forgot to tell you that we didn't, but we, we collected a few that we think are wild. Well, they might be escaped for many years mm-hmm. or maybe wild, we don't know. But those guys didn't have the uh, fusarium, the fusarium in those plants did not have those regions of the genome that were pathogenic. So. We're thinking of following up with that and sort of understanding the evolution of Fusarium in that context. Yeah, so is, is it thought that that's, it, so Fusarium is a vanilla specialist or it's uh, No, or it's, it's, a, it's a huge genus and, uh, well, it's a very specious, specious genus. Mm-hmm. It's a very large um, genus, but, and it's, it's, it's sort of specialist to certain crops. Certain species are specific, for example, for banana, tomato, and others. Everyone has oh, their okay. own clade. Gotcha, um, yeah. And in vanilla, supposedly there's one Oxysporum vanillae that's supposed mm. to be a sp- specific of vanilla, but we discovered five species of Fusarium in there. So oh, okay. we think that there's a, there's a, yeah. it's a lot more complex and fungi are very hard to classify. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. anyway, yeah, so it's very diverse. So that's a very interesting thing that um, we're doing because we want to be able to develop technology to detect the pathogenic regions in the, in the sick plants before they express the the sickness yeah. so farmers don't plant them because it takes four years to wait for the for the vanilla pots so if oh, they're wow. sick you yeah. shouldn't wait for four years because right? yeah, they're going to die yeah. as soon as they start <laughs> flowering so so that's sort of the the more applied part of my lab that we're trying to mm. move forward i have a very stupid question but is vanilla domesticated like is it's it... not a stupid question it's a very good question yeah one of my you don't have to say that That's okay. to say no no but no but i'm gonna tell you why it's not a stupid yeah. question but but one of my mentors used to say that there are no stupid questions there's only stupid answers <laughs> <laughs> but anyway um no it's not stupid because most people first of all most people are not clear what it means to be domesticated even mm. people that study domestication like myself sometimes it's hard to define something yeah. or find the domestication syndrome, which is what we call those series of traits that define a mm. domesticated species. Yeah. Usually it's the loss of uh, ability to disperse, to reproduce naturally, um, changes, dramatic changes in the fruits, you know, we make things right. huge that otherwise the yeah. plant couldn't carry. So, yeah. so vanilla, there's been a debate on whether vanilla is becoming domesticated. Mm. Right now, it's assumed it's not. But what people have said, and there's some evidence for that, is that it's chemically domesticated. So its chemistry mm. has changed. And so that's, you know, again, from the, what we were talking about psychics, you know, maybe yeah. from the outside it looks the same. But from right. the inside, maybe it's not the same. And also because it's not pollinated by insects anymore for a mm. long, long time. And all the commercial vanilla is pollinated by hand. Which Even is in Mexico, it, 
even in Mexico. I guess because yeah. the bees are just, they like the forest and yeah, people don't want to grow. It's not there anymore. People, <laughs> yeah, don't, exactly. yeah, people don't want to have a vanilla plantation like in the middle of the wet tropical rainforest. Yeah. yeah. yeah and it's not, a, I mean, it's efficient. It's very efficient, but mm-hmm. then you, you're waiting for it, you know, and, and then you can't control it. So it's, it's different. Yeah. Um, so, so, so the fact that the, so one of our ideas actually was that the fact that you get these not these hand pollinated flowers and then bee pods also makes it a little bit more susceptible to disease because insects are vectors for good the good bacteria that sometimes plant need plants need right. um and so we, we think that's a missing component in what we see now in vanilla and it, in, hmm. in the long run it's missing some of the microbiome that the healthy microbiome that it should get through the insects oh, so, that's so interesting could be starting to get domesticated yeah. their plants are usually bigger and i mean in madagascar they're huge but they're hybrids usually those are hybrids they're not just plentifolia yeah. um they ha- they they force them to produce a lot of pods they because you are hand pollinating usually bees will pollinate one or two flowers and then people hand pollinate everything so oh, okay, okay they force the plant to have uh, you know like 10 pods per plant or more versus mm-hmm. just one or two so i'm guessing that that will have an effect eventually on its domesticated yeah. you know like behavior. and i guess if they're specifically hybridizing it so that it's bigger I, it, that kind of yeah, yeah. that's that's why I, yeah. I said maybe that's because of the hybridization mm-hmm. yeah so that's really who knows we don't know we yeah. don't know <laughs> <laughs> but peppers obviously the yeah, yeah, yeah peppers the definitely peppers domesticated. domesticated yes yeah. yeah what do the wild ones look like are they just have no less do they have less capsaicin too or is it no they're very hot actually they're super spicy oh cool yeah they're super spicy so the wild ones oh i should have i, I should have brought you some plants <laughs> oh, that's next okay. time that's, that's but, what, yeah so the wild ones are very small they're like this big uh-huh. They're very, very, very small, and they're usually either round or a little bit um, like uh, ovate. Hmm. And and uh, but but they are no bigger than this. And all the domesticated pepper, as you know, well, well you can have the bell pepper that's giant. Yeah, yeah. You have all these really long peppers. So mm-hmm. that's the main difference in terms of fruit of um, shape and size. Mm-hmm. Um, that it was a huge increase in size and 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 colors and forms. Yeah. Um, but the spiciness, no. The spicy actually, we've selected on the other on the other way. We've made them really? less. Well, many many varieties. Others are not. Others some, are some super are hot, spicy. right? Yeah, yeah. Like the the California, um, ri- uh, how do you call this Reaper? The California Reaper. Oh, and yeah, There's other yeah. other super super Something, super hot chili yeah, peppers yeah. that you can die if you eat one. For sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> Ghost chilies and. Yeah. Uh-huh, those 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 guys. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Um, so but but originally select- was it like to prevent mammal predation like it like birds don't feel Probably. it and mammals might avoid yeah, it birds don't have the receptors for capsaicinoids yeah. and 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 the mammals do so that's one hypothesis that mm-hmm. that's why they're hot i mean it could also be a byproduct of something else it's just, um, yeah, it's just that's the way it is yeah yeah some precursors are actually vanilla vanilla related precursors before the the, the capsaicinoids form like one of the oh. final steps of the capsaicinoid metabolism is a vanilla derivative so it could also be like just mm. you know byproduct just for people, people think that it's to um deter mammals yeah yeah and yeah why does vanilla taste the way it does is there is there a just so story for that or is it it just it, it has um jesus i forgot the name for this compound but no it has it has specific compounds that are mm-hmm. um give it the vanilla taste and yeah. so you can enhance that actually people do that with the hybrids and, and they're trying to do it genetically the thing is the commercial vanilla market and i guess buyers they're against anything that's genetically modified so there's it's more like a selection of actually there's a lot of artisan work in vanilla vanilla um um, mark just in the marketing of vanilla for 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 instance usually companies have someone that's the expert person that goes and smells the pot to determine Mm -hmm. how much um vanilla flavor they would have and Hmm. you know the texture it's very much like coffee or wine yeah yeah Huh. And also here in Mexico, again, the process is very lengthy for curing the pots. It's several moons. You know, they, oh, they, wow. you have to do like a very lengthy process, which comes from the pre-Hispanic Mexicans. Oh, cool. um, um, Where you no cure the pots for, I think it's I, uh, 21 days. Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah, 20, 20 days. 20, 20 soles, no? 20 suns. 20 soles. Yeah, 20 um, suns. Yeah. 20 suns. And, and you huh. have to smell it and you have to, you know, like 
feel it and so on so it's very oh, wow. artisanal cool. it's very crafty you know is it crafty the word uh, you know like uh, i know what you mean not yeah. crafty I'm... artisanal no yeah artisanal? yeah yeah artisanal. 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 artisanal yeah artisanal sorry yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> my my english is getting worse by the minute oh no it's but, um, it's ex it's at least artisanal. as good as my english yeah. right now yeah <laughs> <laughs> i've been away from the us for a long time now yeah so, no you anyway. it's perfect yeah artisanal yeah it's very artisanal and and so i think the content of um, vanilla related comp there, there's a lot there's not just one there's a lot mm. that give it that the vanilla flavor um, cool. it's a family of, comp of vanilla vanilloid compound compounds huh. so um, yeah there's very but they're they are not specific the, the, the intermediate products of that metabolism are not specific just to vanilla they're also plus they're found in other plants. in other plants yeah. in other in other pathways but the final the final step of that of that pathway is just exclusive just, of vanilla yeah yeah oh that's really cool yeah <laughs> Um, well, I don't want to keep you forever. I, you've, you've already been like so generous with your time. So, um, I, yeah, I don't know. Thank you so much for, for doing this. And it was, it was really fun talking to you. I, I don't like, it's, it's fun to like reach out to people that I don't usually have like a good excuse to, to say hi to. <laughs> Anytime. So, yeah, this was really fun. Um, but yeah, thanks so much. And yeah, stay safe down there and everything. Yeah, yeah you too. It's going to go for a while. Don't yeah. drink bleach. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've, I've seen, I've seen your tweets about our, oh my uh, current God. yeah, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not great. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, we're in the same boat here. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah. <laughs> we're kind of in the same boat. <laughs> so, I know. Yeah. so I'm, I'm just watching the curve here in Mexico go oh, here oh, and like yeah. half of the people are outside and oh my God, oh, people are yeah. attacking doctors and all. I mean, it's just, yeah, we have to stay happy through science somehow. We have to stay happy. through. So thank you. I've just been like quarantined <laughs> by myself for a while. So this, this assignment has been like very healthy for me because I actually like talk to people. So yeah, yeah. No, well, good luck. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. See you. All right. Bye-bye.